welcome to the Nerd Party. Hi, this is Henry Gilroy, co-executive producer of Star Wars Rebels. You're listening to Aggressive Negotiations. We are us, you're you, and this is Aggressive Negotiations, the Star Wars podcast on the Nerd Party Network that comes at you from every single possible corner and dimension of the Star Wars galaxy. I am one of your hosts, Jedi Master John Mills, and with me, as he chooses to be freely and of his own will, is the legendary Jedi Master Matthew Rushing. Matt, welcome to the Council Chamber. Oh, it's so great to be here as I am coming at you um, from the dimension of the Force where Mortis, you know, resides. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if, mm-hmm. if, if my, you know, <laughs> I'm a little fuzzy or, you know, get a little messed up there. Forgive me, you know, it, the static here can be pretty bad, it, you know, because I mean, I'm in the nexus of the force. You well, would think uh, that would give me a better signal, but yeah. On the upside is we'll have this episode and when you're done with it, no time will have passed for you. So it's a win-win. This is true. You know? Yeah, it's a win-win. Yeah, and, and another win-win is to head on over to thenerdparty.com where you can go to thenerdparty.com slash contact and send us an email. You can, of course, engage with us on Twitter at join Nerd Party, uh for the network account, or you can reach out to us directly at the show at the Jedi Masters. And, of course, on Facebook and Instagram, it's The Nerd Party. And there are so many shows on The Nerd Party. We invite you Please come on by, check out Filibuster, check out Time and Space, check out SETI Alpha 3, check out Missing Frames, check out Outpost, check out Nerd Nuptial, check out every single thing that we have, including our YouTube video series, Babble for Five. And uh, there are so many shows, if I've forgotten to mention one, it is purely because I can't keep track of them all in my head. So go over to the nerdparty.com and find out what we have in store. So... We are here on Aggressive Negotiations to discuss the extras that came with the solo home release. Uh, Matt, the two of us, we are avowed. It has been clearly well established by this point that we both loved Solo. Still love Solo. Think Solo is the bee's knees. And I'm guessing you're still on that side of the fence, yeah? Absolutely. Uh, I have only watched the film once to my chagrin. Uh, I would say, you know, I don't like to be remiss. Uh, and we don't like to be remiss on this show, but Never. I am remiss for ha- having not watched Solo more than that. Um, so I'm excited to dive back into it. Uh, but, you know, it, and and I would say that, honestly, watching the extras made me want to dive back into the film and watch it, especially, you know, after having seen you know, the deleted scenes and everything that they mm-hmm. showed and them just talking about the movie and everything. And, and honestly, the uh, the passion of, you know, the different actors talking about the, the their roles and everything, I was just like, man, I just want to go back to, I need to watch Solo again. You know, uh, it's actually, you know, let's jump right to what I would say is probably my favorite extra uh, this time around, and that is the round table. That they have where they have the cast sit down with Ron Howard and he sits down as a moderator. And the thing that instantly jumps out and this is not like breaking news by any stretch of the imagination, but you see what a tremendous positive energy Ron Howard brings to a table. He has such a magnetic uh, energy about him and you see the entire cast, you see how well they interacted, not just with each other, not just the chemistry that was there between them, but how Howard interacted with them was very telling. They were always so open and forthcoming with him. You could tell that this wasn't, you know, putting on an act for the cameras. This was them actually having a discussion with somebody that they respected. And I just, I honestly wish that there had been more of the round table i know that there has to be stuff that they cut out and i know you don't want to go for two hours yeah absolutely but this i mean honestly this is very much along the lines of the type of extras that i want to get on a home release like the director's round table is exactly the type of thing i want to watch 
Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think one of the things that I noticed uh, throughout all the extras is I got the feeling like there were more to the extras, and then they cut things down, you know, so yeah. they can Disneyify the process uh, and yeah. of what happened. But, the, you know, I, I really picked up on what you were talking about with the actors connecting with Howard, and, and specifically I, I felt like at the very end when Alden... And, and it was interesting because the move, uh, in the roundtable... You know, Alden seems very much, it's strange, but he was the star of the film, right? He's solo. And, mm-hmm. and they all seem to kind of take their cues from him at the table um, in a lot of ways. I felt like he, you know, next to Howard, who's the narrator, which right. I loved. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, for the evening. Uh, I just waited for him to say something like, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. You, you know, you know, though, but, but to speak to your thing about the, you know, the, 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 the energy with the cast and, and taking cues and everything, what I thought was so fun to see. And I mean, I, I actually chuckled because it got a genuine reaction from me. And I don't want to give away too much if, if somebody hasn't watched this extra. Um, but one of the things that immediately endeared it to me, aside from everything else, was when they were talking about their experience of finding out they were cast and then mm-hmm. Aaron Reich gives his oh well I couldn't tell anybody so he went you know he's like and I went on a roller coaster and Donald Glover <laughs>, laughs and says that is the most Alden <laughs> answer possible like you yes. can tell that there was an actual affection between everybody that they they actually knew each other on a level besides I just showed mm-hmm. up for work and I thought that was great and Tandy Newton's yep. story about her oh inspiration for Mal yes. was amazing amazing well, and, and not only that, but, you know, uh, Danny Newton just showed what a great storyteller she is in and of herself because she tells the story and she doesn't tell you who she's talking about until the end. And then it turns out that the, the person that she's modeling the character after is her badass mom. Right. Which I just found so fascinating and so beautiful. And it really showed how much... Uh, she had put into the character and how much she had thought about this character and, and it, the, the character, what the character meant to her. Um, and and I kind of loved, too, that, you know, she just embraced the fact that, you know, this character was going to have a certain amount of time on screen, but she was never going to to downplay that. She was going mm-hmm. to bring it to life in a way that made her real. And I mean, you know, I would say, you know, I know a lot of people wanted, you know, were kind of disappointed that she wasn't in more of the movie. But one of the hallmarks of her character was that everybody wanted more of her. And mm-hmm. I thought, you know, that speaks to such a a great, you know, character development in the, you know, the 20 minutes that she's on film that we're all like, man, we wish we had more of that character because she did such a good job with it. And that's why, I mean, you cast an actor of that kind of gravitas to be in these roles because, they might not have as much screen time, but you want people to fall in love with them, whether they live or die, and and still be talking about them after the movie ends. And you know, casting her, I mean, kudos to them on on on, on doing that. But also, uh, you know, thank you, Tandy Newton, for taking the role and and really living in it in such a way that we felt like we were shortchanged. And, and in some ways, I feel like that's a good thing to feel like that with a character, you know. Well, speaking of her character's fate in the film and everything, and of course, you know, when we're having this conversation, we are making the assumption that if you're interested enough to listen about the extras, you've seen the film by this point. And uh, I think that's a good springboard because... um, Hold on one second before we move over there. I just wanted to say the last bit um, that we I got sidetracked, but I just wanted to say, you know, Alden saying to Howard, thank you at the end of that roundtable. I felt like was so genuine and he talked about, you know, and, and I think in many ways you could tell how the cast had responded once Howard came in and it, it felt, it it felt like they felt comfortable. Like they were being taken care of by almost like a father type figure who had come in, taken every, taken the weight of this, you know, even Howard makes reference to that, that he was going to take on this challenge that they had given him to try and make this thing work. And the actor seemed to truly respect him and and be grateful to him. And I, I think that just speaks to who Ron Howard is as a person and what he's like on set and what he brings out in these these extra I mean these 
what he brings out, not in the extras here at the round table, but also just these these cast members, you know, he brought out the best in them. And, and I, I, th- I truly think, you know, from seeing the behind the scenes extras, I think we owe him uh, a, a debt of gratitude for the way that this movie uh, turned out, because without him, I don't know if this movie would have had the heart that I feel like it has. Yeah, well, I, I you know, I, that's that's definitely uh, prevalent through you know through through the extras and uh, you know i i don't know if we want to show too much leg because I, I i'm i'm approaching this as sort of like selling the idea oh you're of wearing the pants yeah right no i you know i the thing is i know that there's got to be somebody out in the audience who hasn't watched these extras yet who's seen the film but hasn't watched the extras might be on the fence might be listening to us talk about them and I very much want to emphasize that not all of these extras are fantastic, but I think they're very much, mm-hmm. on the whole, very much worth watching. And the reason I jumped to Kasdan on Kasdan is because I was not expecting something. I, like the the round table I responded to because there was a, a, a genuine show of chemistry among the, the cast and, and the director. But what I was not expecting from from Kazan on Kazdan was, yeah, there's very much a, um, a, a great, you know, show of respect to Lawrence Kazdan. But I think there's also a tremendous opportunity to understand that Jonathan, like, I think that there is, uh, you know, when Jonathan Kazdan was announced as co-writer, it was like, Oh, Kazdan and Kazdan. Oh, of course, of course. But, when you see Jonathan Kasdan's uh, energy and his interaction with his own dad and when they discuss the character decisions that they had and, and the types of discussions that they had in constructing the film, I think that is a treat as well, specifically because you see, and I think that Lawrence Kasdan has, you know, says something specific about it, but what better way to, to demonstrate the generational appeal of Star Wars than having these two working on it. Somebody who grew up immersed in it because of what his dad did and his dad who's been immersed in it and written, you know, for the movies and everything. Like it's, I think it's just a, a genuinely uh, charming uh, thing for them to have done. Yeah, I really liked that extra i i thought it was a lot of fun i i enjoyed uh, them being honest and saying it wasn't always easy working yeah. together and there were some days john was like yeah i just wanted to go home and get on with my life like i was like yeah i uh, just wanted to be away from my dad basically uh in this process but that it that it was also such a a wonderful opportunity for them to grow closer together and work together and i i appreciated that you could really sense you know that Larry does such a great job of bringing the solo to it, right? You know, the understanding of solo. And John, I think, really brings the rest of the Star Wars galaxy with him. You know, because Kasdan, he's not even seen all the other stuff. You know, John's seen it all. He knows the Clone Wars. He knows the prequels. You know, and so um, by putting those two together, you come up with the best of both worlds, like somebody who truly understands the character of Han Solo as who he'll become. And he's winding back the clock. And then you have his son who's there to help him, like, fit in the Star Wars galaxy at that time period, which he's not as familiar with. And I think it really created something that felt so Star Wars because it felt like it felt it felt like it fit in that time period. But it also felt like it did the character justice it did all the characters we saw justice um yep. in a way that made it fit perfectly with everything we know that comes and so you know I, you really see that those two working together is what makes this work in the end and that was really neat to see and i mean i can't imagine you know working with um my dad on anything like that it just but the fact that they found a way to make it work and then it it came out like this yeah well, I uh, I have in the past worked with actually for my brother, and I can attest that it is not easy to work with family. Um, it's incredibly, <laughs> incredibly difficult because there's so much unintentional baggage that you might bring to the work day uh, oh, from I, time to time. I bet. Uh, but and and the th- the thing that uh, is so 
sad in my eye uh, about watching the Kazan on Kazan thing is understanding that uh, Jonathan Kazan's part got cut from the movie. And I I, like my heart broke. I was like, can you imagine growing up immersed in Star Wars, loving Star Wars, knowing it inside and out, adoring it, getting figures, playing with it? It's a part and parcel of your life. And then, you know, you're going to be seen. However, however, fleetingly on screen, I'm in a Star Wars movie. And then your scene gets axed. That's just got to be that's got to be a heartbreaking moment to be like, oh, okay, that's fine. You know? I just yeah. I felt for him in that moment. I know how I'd have felt. It, yeah, sure, it's <laughs> it's for the best guys, but okay. I heard him in an interview. He was talking about. He's like, you know, they 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 had to cut the role because I was distracting from the star of the film. He's very right. self deprecating and very funny, <laughs> yeah. um, which I appreciated. Uh, you know, uh, one of the the extras that really stuck out to me, and and mainly it was because. Um, you know, and I love this stuff. I love getting to see how they actually film scenes and, and the technology used and the, mm-hmm. in the way that they they mix practical and special effects and VFX all together. And that escape from Corellia, I had no idea that I was going to see them actually have built a speeder as a four-wheel drive vehicle that they could actually drive around you know, and, and get the motion, and and it did so much in the movie um, that I was not expecting. Like I just, to me, it's fascinating to see them take these old and new technologies and meld them together perfectly. And I think it created just a, a phenomenal scene. That I mean, every time I watch that scene, I think to myself how good it all looked. And mm-hmm. now I know why, because you know they're they're sparing no expense in a good way right. to to make this the absolute best it can be and it is real feeling as possible which is very very good like i you know yes. it reminds me of like the the way that that um peter jackson dealt with the lord of the rings trilogy like everything was as real as could possibly be so you could feel the reality when you got to the these big special effects moments and i feel like you know, solo and um, and I would say honestly, you know, for the most part, these new Star Wars movies, they're really doing that um, as as much as they can. They're taking everything that George gave them in the prequels and all the tricks of the trade, then, and they're melding them with all the old tricks of the trade, and it's 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 become this beautiful marriage. And they're creating some really special stuff. Well, yeah, because it is a recognition of using the right tool for the right job, if I may borrow yes. a line from yes. Scotty in Star Trek V. But it's it, it truly is something where you realize that they're, they're choosing stuff. They know the audience is uh, astute enough, learned enough in their tricks of the trade to look for the seams. And they know they have to work extra hard to mm-hmm. make those seams harder to find. And one of the things that is remarkable about watching the Escape from uh, Corellia thing come together is I think people sometimes really lose sight of the fact. Even at, okay, so let's take our, you know, let, let's take a, a moviegoer that might not have loved Solo, right? Sit them down and watch that feature because I know a friend who you know, who looks at it and says, ah, they just, you know, he, his whole attitude is, ah, they just put something together and I sit down and have him watch escape from Corellia and say, listen, not only did they build these speeders, not only did they do all this digital trickery, somebody actually had to sit down and work out a map of how these little islands worked and how the roads worked. And, and that's why there's such visual continuity in the scenes is, uh, you know, is the fact that they're not just making it up on the fly. Somebody planned out how that part of Corellia looks. And if anything, it actually reminded me of uh, looking back and seeing how they planned out the speeder chase in Attack of the Clones. Because I remember all those years ago seeing that, I was like, oh, wow, this is so cool. But knowing that somebody sat down and said, okay, our chase is going to be this long, and this is what it's going to do, and these are the levels they're on, and they planned out every sector of the city that they flew through so that they had an idea of where everything was in relation to each other. And the, the, the escape from Corellia definitely works because of the fact that there is a definite sense of space and place through the whole thing. And I, you know, I, I think that is, um, 
what blows my mind about that and learning about that in specific, but also the behind the scene thing about the, the train heist is really realizing one of the most heartbreaking things to me about the the arguments or what have you about solo that have happened um, is the fact that this is some of the best special effects I've seen <laughs> this year in the last couple oh, of years yeah. and seeing these scenes come together, I still get that sense of wonder and I don't wind up going and watching the scene and saying, Oh, well, yeah, I can see that. I'm looking at it saying, Holy cow, look what they did. Mentioning the, the train heist and then, you know, the, the, the maelstrom with the, the Kessel run, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I, what I loved about this is that there was a freedom that happened. Um, you know, if you listen to um, so Chris McQuarrie, who directed uh, Mission Impossible Fallout, and of course Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, an incredible director, and those films, if you listen, are put together mostly on the fly. Like, they are coming up with these things. It, it, it's not always, I mean, it's just not as planned out as you'd think it would be. And and what I saw here in this film was the freedom to be able to do that um, for these different sequences so that they would plan it out. But there was also a freedom of spontaneity to have some, like, you know. And I, I, uh, I loved learning in the Kessel Run sequence that, you know, they Definitely wanted this to feel like a Jules Verne type of thing where you keep going through, uh, you know, the different like a sailing ship, all the things you'd run into, basically. But then Ron was feeling that it was it was it was a little bit maybe too routine. He's like, can we get a monster in there? And so they mm -hmm. gave you the big tentacled monster. And so it it that type of freedom, I think, is is great to see in, in filmmaking. Like you're not just tied to everything you're doing that you had as an idea, but you're also able to come up with new ideas. And I think, you know, you look at that scene, and I think it, he's definitely right. It works much better having that threat there on top of a maelstrom that's, you know, pulling them in. You know, it, you know, it feels almost insurmountable as a problem, uh, a couple of problems. And I think it works much better. And, and, and that's one of the things that I, I found you know, on top of that, throughout all of these extras, is that I, you know, seeing the th choices that they made, I feel like you really come down to them having made the right choices for what they added and maybe what they didn't add. I, I think they really did a very good job um, deciding what should be in the movie and then what shouldn't be in the movie. Yeah, let's go ahead and embrace that one, okay? Because the deleted scenes, I can honestly say, because I was really looking forward to this. I was like, oh my gosh, Han in the Academy, him getting kicked out of, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. it's, you know, line of dialogue, oh, extended this, oh. And looking at it, and I love seeing deleted scenes. I always will. I always want them included. Yeah, me too. This is the first time in a while, though, where I can... I can honestly say, and the thing is, this is going to sound eye-rollingly, uh, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid or what have you, but this is the first time in a while where I've watched deleted scenes and said, yep, every single one of those cuts makes sense. Eh, nope, I wouldn't, have, I, I wouldn't have kept any of that in. I would have let that go, absolutely. Like, right mm -hmm. down to uh, Mimbin, the, the longer yep. battle sequence... Yeah, I'm glad. Uh, let, let's yeah, get us to where longer. we got to be first. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I what I what I felt was this. I you know the George style of editing really came into play here. Like we don't need this. This is not necessary. You know this mm -hmm. is and and it, we just get to the action quicker if we do this. And you you know it, it's that thing. If I pull this out, does it make it better? And you know we've talked to Nick about that so many times with him working on the Clone Wars, saying that they would do that same thing. You know, um, he, he, him even mentioning to us, you know, there was that, there was a sequence in one episode that Dave really loved, but he was like, take it out, it's going to make it better. Even though he loved it, he just, he's like, excise it, and it yeah. immediately made the episode so feel better. And, I, you know, each one of these scenes, I, I, you know, I can see the... Um, the why of why you filmed them, but none of them feels the only one I watched. And I was like, okay, I could see maybe if you reshot this and, 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 uh, and had a better take was the Corellian foot chase. 
because there's a nice moment between Khan and Kira. But even that, I don't need it. It's just kind of a, it's kind of a goofy moment, um, and it does kind of help build the the romance a little bit. But it, again, it's it's just it's not necessary. I don't have to have it, and I didn't feel like the take was probably the best take either. And so it's just I'm, I'm glad that they cut that out. Um, and, and same thing with um, the meat dried and extended scene. Like the comedy going on there is yes. not is not good. It hurts the scene particularly because that one is a menacing scene and not a funny scene and i yeah i just right and the, totally and the way that i understand why you cut it and the way that it's cut in the film yep you you get that sense of menace because hans hans just sort of like blends into the background he doesn't get these moments of like haha funny food take it's more exactly. like oh i better put my food down this is this is not this is not going yeah. particularly well yes. right now yes because you get the the feeling like Oh, S is getting real. I'm not hungry right. anymore. Right. Instead of this, like, oh, I've got weird things dangling from my chin. You know. Right. And it, and I think that is probably, if I were to venture a guess, seeing something like that being cut, and even seeing some of the other stuff um, here and there, some of the trims, it seems to me more along the lines of that's probably the more comedic vein that w- would have been indulged with uh lord miller as opposed to it's a much more serious focused yep. film with howard at the helm is what i would say and I, yeah. again i'm not saying that to like you know knock anybody or anything like that i'm just saying it it, it probably would have been more along those lines had they stayed on board and you know, I, I mean, considering the fact that I'm thrilled with the way that it turned out, uh, I think it was a good choice. Yeah, and, and I think the scene I was most excited to see was the cadet scene. Right. And that plays much better in the novelization than it did here. Just the way it was shot and everything, that it just something seemed off about it. It it it, it wasn't fulfilling the the, the place that they were hoping it would. Uh, and again, the cut you get in the film is just so much better. I'll, we'll have you flying in no time for that line to come from the recruiting officer mm-hmm. to there. It's it's just in some ways it just adds mystery, and it's like you could write a whole other book about Han's experience as a cadet, right? And and but you just get that that did not go well. He's right. not even a flyer, you know, he's a ground troop and so it's less, there's there's no need to kind of go into that scene especially with the way that it was given to us at least in the extended uh, there this this extra scene it it just doesn't work. It really doesn't. Right. I I I could see an easy need to go back and it's like okay, well we got to shoot like a whole scene in front of and behind this to sort of make it work mm-hmm. uh, a little bit better. And, yep. I, you know, personally, I, I still laugh. I've laughed every single time the guy says, we'll have you flying in no time. And then it has that yeah. cut and he's <laughs> flying through the air. I, that's just, I think that's just the perfect way to do it. And th- you still get mm-hmm. that line here. But the scene itself is so. It's dry. Like, yeah, it, 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 it's it, dour. There's, there's, it, it, it's really. Yeah, it's it's lacking oomph. Yeah. And pizzazz. and. It would have been, you know, I, I mean, it's nice to see, oh, look, that's a screen like the one on the Death Star. But it's like, eh, mm-hmm. yeah, I've seen it before mm-hmm. and I saw it in Rogue One. It's like, eh, I'm good. It's OK. Yeah. You know, it, it, so all that to emphasize, it, it's just really it's really intriguing because I remember and I, I say this simply for the sake of comparison. There were things cut, you know, cut scenes from Last Jedi where I watched them and anybody who's been listening may recall that my reaction was why on earth did you cut that out that yes. that had a place in the story <laughs> whereas everything here i was like yeah, yeah yeah good call good call well and i think what it it went to show was the way in which this really they had put a lot of thought into this i think you know you, you really see 
that they deliberated over each one of these things as they're editing and what works and what doesn't. And they made the best decisions for the film to make the best film they could possible. So I absolutely 100% agree with all the choices that they made here because after watching these, I'm like, yeah, you, you, you shouldn't have left any of these in. These really are just extraneous scenes that are not needed for the best version of the film. The best version you gave us is what we got. You know, it's... It, which is, you know, again, we we're talking. Uh, you you do watch some films, right? And the extended cut is better than the original. You yes. know, um, like Batman v Superman, one of my favorite films. I don't watch the original theatrical cut anymore because it's not as good. You know, so um, there are those movies. Like I haven't seen the original theatrical cuts of the Lord of the Rings films since the extended versions came out because I don't need the other ones. Uh, the extended cuts are the better uh, films to me, so. especially Two Towers on that one. Yeah, Two it, Towers absolutely. is so yes. much better than the theatrical, yes. and I love the theatrical really, cut of Two Towers. Yeah. But man, that extended cut of Two Towers is yep. So, well, that that's a yeah. whole side topic for <laughs> that's a whole other podcast, a, a different a different show. Uh, but, you know, and the thing is, I'm trying to remember specifically um, what moment it was, but watching that remaking the Falcon, seeing that, mm-hmm. and the thing that I really loved about all of the behind the scenes stuff with this was seeing how much everybody loved working, seems to have loved working on it, and the, you know, especially the crew. The people that had to remake the Falcon, the people that had to rethink things, the people that had to say, "Okay, well, this is the medical bed where we saw Chewie in The Force Awakens and uh, I guess Luke in uh, Empire Strikes Back. And or was he or was he in the bunk above the uh, the Dejeric board? I don't remember which bunk he was in. I always thought Chewie was in the same bunk he was in. in, uh, Yeah, I think they're in the same bunk, actually. But then. You know, when they they talk about, well, we get to go in and like sort of like poke around some other places, you suddenly realize one of the most fun things is that there's always somewhere to push a little bit harder in terms of expanding on the layout. Even if, I mean, the the Millennium Falcon is one of the most best known, poured over, obsessed about designs in film history. And can you imagine being given the task to come in? And say, well, let's let's do a spin on it. Let's see what we can do to make this fresh. And I, you know, when I said when we were talking about it with uh, with Nick, um, I fell in love with the ship all over again. And I think that's specifically because yeah. you had people that said we got to figure out a way to make this fresh. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I, I felt like was so smart, you know, when they talk about redesigning the Falcon, there, you know, they go through all these different iterations, and I mean, especially if you look at the the art of book, there's mm-hmm. so many different ideas of what do we do with this, and they went, I, I felt like they followed the ship itself, you know, they took the basic shape, and okay, what maybe could be missing here, and then when you add the escape pod, and you know, you give it a different. Uh, radar dish and you give it some different fins in the back but then you just clean it up and you paint it and you get that you know uh, automotive look to it like it just rolled off the the assembly line there at uh Corellia Prime you know it just it, it just it has yeah. such an iconic look now that I I love this Falcon as much as I love the old Falcon like that's a crazy thought well, and even what you know, what you were saying about the paint job is I, like the one they wound up with. I, I don't, you know, it, you know, they made the right choice because I look at the other ones and I'm like, yeah, that's good, but it's not as good as the one you went with. Like, you, you know, that's yep. got to be so satisfying as a designer to just hit it like that, to just stick the landing and the inside of the ship as well. That whole idea of you know walking around and seeing what it looked like when Lando owned it and how different the space was how you know and how differently you would inhabit something like that how much more you know it, it's just such a testament to the two characters like they you know to get back to the round table when ron howard asked them you know how would han describe lando if lando wasn't around how would lando describe han and just that's reflected in the ship itself and the, and how they treat it and and what it looks like and it, it, you know i just say i just think that's really it's amazing, and I think that uh, Kazan himself, I, you know, I don't know whether he said it in Kazan on Kazan or in the remaking Millennium Falcon, where 
he said the Falcon is a character. It is a character in the films. And I think this really drives that home. It was something I was, I was thinking about that because in that extra we see one of the times that we see the visit from Lucas to the mm-hmm. to the set. And it it's in that space where um you you kind of see him on the set and he's hanging out with everybody and you know he's watching the you know the shooting that's happening and of course that's where he gives them I- the idea about you know Han not you know putting the cape back just right. throwing it on the ground basically so he can make out with his girl which i mean who puts it back on the rack when you, you know <laughs> yeah um so i just i loved all that and and it really you know it was something special because in in that Roundtable Alden talked about getting to spend a little bit more time with um, Lucas, you know, yeah. recently, and how he said he was just so into the movie. Yeah. And he really had so much fun talking about it. But then, as they were talking about that scene where, you know, Lucas makes this, you know, this suggestion about filming. I just love Ron Howard getting like a little schoolboy in, in some ways where he's just like, oh, and, you know, he he does the motion. And then I just I just right. realized in that moment that George has so much Han in him, you know, like. And, and so, you, yeah, you you you've got the to see the the way in which these people respected George. But you also I, I just loved that George got to go and share the experience with them and have fun and 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 to see George smile on a Star Wars set like that and genuinely seem to be happy to be there you know i i feel like that that comes through for me as a fan in the way that the movie all comes together when i see all this behind the the scenes stuff i understand why i love this movie and and what it yeah. did make me want um is that you know the the Extras are brief. I mean, there's it's about an hour and a half, you know, yeah, uh, all together. He, yeah, uh, I, I, I don't. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, 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 but that I think is a very important point because if if there is a, a set of, there are two sets of extras in the history of Star Wars that I have I have dragged since the beginning, and I will continue to drag. Force Awakens and Rogue One. I remember, you know shouting to the skies that what is this this is nuts what are you doing that like i expect more as a star wars fan i want more stuff and regardless of how you feel about the film last jedi delivered last jedi gave more of those extras it was like okay yeah this is this is what i like give more of this to me and solo continues the tradition it really real solo con this home release has convinced me that somebody heard the complaints of longtime fans who said, I don't care so much about whether it's my favorite star Wars movie or not. I want to know how this was made. And after watching these extras, even though a lot of the featurettes are, are chopped up the way that the rogue one ones were, I still feel like I, I have a better understanding of how this came together. And that is something I didn't, necessarily have at the end of the Rogue One extras where I said eh, I want more what hey come mm-hmm. on and and the thing is yeah even doing doing a one-to-one that had a troubled production as well and this one has you know a legendarily troubled production and they still gave me the extras I wanted on this so you you can do it you can get there yeah, I think it helps, you know, that Ron has so much time with this movie and reshoots so much of it. So, you know, it, mm-hmm. it, it gives them that opportunity. Yeah, the only thing, you know, I would say to that is that watching these, it's like, man, I could have I, I could have watched another hour's worth mm-hmm. of extras, you know, um, you know, really going into uh, I, because, you know, they, they cover, you know, Fort Ipso and some of the creatures and everything to design. It's like. I could have a whole hour just going into the the design of the film, you know, the design of Dryden's ship, the design of the look of his ship, you know, all of those kind of things. It's like I I would love to watch that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I feel like this is it, we're really on a trend to have better extras. I would just say, and if anyone from Lucasfilm is listening, if you are listening. I just encourage you to continue this and just give continue to give us more depth, you know, mm-hmm. um, 
give give us more in depth uh, making of documentaries when it comes to uh, the creature design, the new ship design. Uh, maybe having I would love to have had you know a, a roundtable thing with Kasdan, Kasdan and uh, Howard talking mm-hmm. specifically about story and you know ideas for story they didn't use all that kind of stuff. I loved um, hearing from the um, the DP on the film and mm-hmm. and uh, the when they were talking about the the train heist and the way that they shot this movie. So that all the lighting was as realistic as possible. Um, And that's one of the things I've noticed about this film is it has a very realistic lighting sense. It doesn't look movie-ish. It just looks like you're photographing real life. Like it can be dark in places, but that's because there isn't an odd light in a bar like that. You know, that kind of stuff. Like I really appreciate the thought process getting behind these people's brains of why are we doing what we're doing for the movie and i really responded to that here in these extras and yeah all i want is just i you know maybe i just sound uh, ungrateful but i'm like yeah i just want more because it, what you're giving me here is good stuff well if people haven't been sold by this point uh on on buying this for the extras or anything like that if you haven't yet made your home purchase i would also urge you if you can to look for the uh, the Target edition because there is oh, something yes, a little yes. extra on that mm-hmm. that uh, is now making the rounds and actually created something of a splash on a, 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 a publication down here that they have snuck a little bit of a preview of Galaxy's Edge, but you yes, have to have the Target yes. extra to get it. And so not only that, but it comes with a booklet that has some oh very my gosh. interesting information yep. about the characters. In fact, we learn in that booklet, and it's been all over the internet today on Twitter, yeah. that uh as we're recording this, that is, um that, you know, the the idea of droid rights was something that had specifically been a seed planted by George years ago. Yeah. And you learn that from that Target exclusive. So, yeah, I'm I'm very happy that I got that Target exclusive. Um, cannot wait. I have not got a chance to because I've just been so busy to dive into the booklet that, that came with it. But it is very nice. It, it's got it's well laid out. I flipped through it a little bit, but I didn't actually get to read any of it. Um, and I can't wait to now because there's obviously these little nuggets of information in there, which I think is fantastic. The vibe of it, and I, I haven't read it in, you know, I have not yet committed it to memory, uh, but uh, the vibe of it is very much reminiscent of those movie magazines that used to come out uh, yeah, back in the yeah. days, the old trilogy and stuff like that, where it's, you know, you would go up to the newsstand and it was like, you know, some exclusive official collector's magazine all about the making of Return of the Jedi. Still one of my prized and treasured uh, pieces uh, in my in my collection, like Dryden Voss's collection of stuff. I guess. Yeah, I feel like my office looks like Dryden's, but to a geek. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's that's it. That's <laughs> an accurate, accurate representation. So, and you know uh, yeah. what? Uh, what I what I will mention: there are a couple extras I do feel like are just negated and missing here. Like I don't understand why there isn't a mall extra. Mm-hmm. And I don't understand why there is not an extra about Emphis Nest and her gang. Yeah, that would have been really nice to have. That would have been really, really nice to have, especially because in the circles we move in, at least. I and you know, I, I, you know how I feel about Emphis Nest, and I really, you know, everybody. I want a sequel to Solo, but honestly, if you're going to give me a live action series, I'd love to find out a little bit more about Emphis Nest. Like give her, give her sweet. a little mini series or something. Bring her on board. I, I'm, that I am would be so on board sweet. for that. Emphis Nest series, yes, yes. Give me, give me a little eight episode series. I'm good. Do that for me, please. And you know, and the you know, and the actress inhabited the role so well. Oh, but anyway, anyway. Um, but yeah, I you know, overall, very very happy uh, with the extras on Solo. And uh, again, if you haven't bought your copy, I do. If you get a chance, if you're able to, to go seek out the Target uh, edition because it it is worth a little bit of extra money, but it, it is worth it this time. But Matt, if uh, people want to talk to you about the inner workings of Solo's home release and the extras that you get on it, where can they find you online? 
Absolutely. You can find me on Twitter, MattRushing02. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram under the same name. I'm here on the network doing a show with my good friend Dre Kaufman as we talk about Harry Potter each week on Owl Post, one chapter at a time. Um, we are right at the end of the Goblet of Fire. Uh, so honestly, this is a show that you can pick up anytime. You can go back and listen to anytime as you're rereading this the series. So I hope that you will check it out. You can also find me over on the Track FM Network. I do a couple of shows there. One is called The Orb with Chris Jones as I talk about Star Trek Deep Space Nine with him. I do our general geek show, which we are talking about everything under the sun that we can, fandom-wise. Uh, you know, John was just there as we did the 200th episode of the show talking about The Matrix. And so it really is just a blast to get together and talk about, you know, geeky movies that we love and have made an impact and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then last but not least, I do a show with my friend Courtney, and it's called Cinema Stories, and we talk about films through the lens of faith. Um, it, John, if anybody wants to uh, wax eloquent about their favorite <laughs> extras or maybe they have some ideas of extras they would like to see that they didn't see here and they're like, oh, we just made it so much better, where can they find you? Oh, well, you can find me out there prowling through the cosmos uh, trying to escape monsters by the mall as Kessel Junkie, K-E-S-S-E-L-J-U-N-K-I-E, on your social network of choice, uh, up to and including Letterboxd and Goodreads, probably probably where I'm most active nowadays, socially. Um, and you can also find me uh, co-hosting Words with Nerds with my pal Craig. So all of that being said, Matt, I think there's only one thing left to say. I think it's time to close negotiations. John, negotiations are closed. Join the revolution. Join the nerd party.